Hey guys, in this video we will look at a very important aspect of bandgap design which is startup. In the last video we discussed this circuit. We said that we want to make voltages at V1 and V3 and current in these two branches equal. And for that we put a feedback around this circuit. Now we have seen that there will be a point where these two conditions will be met and that will give us our desired PTAT current into these branches. But there exists another point where voltages V1 and V3 as well as current I1 and I2 will be equal. And at that point all these four values will be zero. Think about it. If there is no current in these two branches, that means currents are zero, these two currents are equal. Which is a perfectly valid solution for this circuit. Now if currents are zero, voltages at these nodes will also be zero. And since voltages at both nodes are zero and hence equal, amplifier will be perfectly happy and will be sitting there doing nothing. Meaning to say it is a stable operating point. And this is precisely the existence of this second stable operating point that we need to think about startup. Now let's look at these two operating point in some more details and see what lies in between. We know that because of the presence of diode, the IV relation in these two branches are non-linear. And one simple way to solve these kind of non-linear relationship is to do it graphically. For that we plot the IV curves of these points on the same graph. And wherever those curves meet is the solution. So let's start with the diode D1. So this plot is typical diode IV plot. Except in the standard form V is on the X axis and I is on the Y axis. Now let's plot the same curve for diode D2. This V2 is same type of curve as V1 except V2 is always somewhat less than V1. And this is because D2 is n time bigger than D1. So if you just look at these two curves, they meet only at one point that is at origin. In other words, the only way where voltage across and current into these two diodes are equal is to have no current at all. Now let's plot the IV curve of R1 which we already know will be simply a straight line passing through the origin. To get the IV curve at V3, we simply add the IV curves of D2 and R1. So V3 also begins at origin and initially it remains close to V2 but diverges more and more as current increases. So we see that V3 meets V1 at two points, one at the origin which is the undesired solution and again at some higher value of current which is our desired solution. Any other operating condition except these two is not stable. If circuit finds itself in one of those unstable operating point, then loop will move the circuit in one of the stable points. But which of the two stable points? Now the fact is, if the circuit is anywhere in this region, it will always move to the desired operating point. Now to understand how this happens, we need to look into the loop dynamics into some more details. Now we know that this is a feedback loop. But which kind? Is it a negative feedback or a positive? So if we trace the loop starting from V3, amplifier acts as a non-inverting path because V3 goes to the positive terminal of this amplifier. But there is an inverting stage in form of P2 which is a common source amplifier. So in all this looks a negative feedback loop. But if we start with V1 then there are two inversion in the loop. One is caused by the amplifier because now V1 goes to the negative terminal of the amplifier and other is the common source P1. So this in fact makes it a positive feedback. As a matter of fact there are two loops in this circuit. One is negative and other is positive feedback. But overall this feedback loop can only be either positive or negative feedback. It can't be both. And it is the gain of these two paths which will ultimately decide which one it will be. So if the gain of positive feedback path is higher than negative feedback path then it will be a positive feedback system. Otherwise it will be a negative feedback system. Now in each of these two feedback paths there are two stages. One stage is this amplifier which is common to both the paths. The other gain stage is found by these common source PMOS stages and these diode and diode resistor elements. Now again this PMOS stage is same for both the paths. So difference in the gain eventually boils down to the difference in impedance of this diode and this diode resistor combination. The impedance of resistor is simply its value R1. 
In order to find the small signal resistance of these diodes, let's write their VI equations again. Now to find the small signal impedance, we simply differentiate the voltages with their respective currents. So we find that impedance of these diodes is simply Vt over current into it. But since currents are equal because of the presence of these current mirrors, that means these impedance are also equal. And from this argument, it looks like that impedance of negative path will always dominate because there is an additional R1 in this path. Now these impedance may be equal at the higher value of current, but this cannot be true for whole range. And we can appreciate this fact by just looking at these two plots of the diode voltages. If the impedance of these two parts are exactly equal and they start with the origin, these two plots cannot be different. As a matter of fact, this VI relation is only an approximate equation. A more precise equation includes minus one factor in it. So let's bring that in. So after using a more accurate equation, we see that the impedance equation of two diodes are indeed different. And the reason of this difference is D2 is n time bigger. Now since I1 and I2 are equal currents, the impedance of D1 is always somewhat bigger. At higher value of current, we can practically ignore the contribution of IS and NIS term and hence the two impedance appear to be equal. At extremely low value of currents, these impedances would be very high in mega ohms or maybe in giga ohms. So as a result, at such very low value of current, even after the presence of R1 in the negative feedback path, it is the gain of positive feedback which dominates. To get a better feel, let's assign some numerical values to these components. So here we have assumed IS to be 1 picoampere, N to be 8 and temperature to be 25 degrees Celsius. Clearly RD1 is much bigger than RD2. So even after the presence of R1, which is of the order of few tens of kilo ohms, it is clearly the positive feedback gain which is higher. Now this is an extreme example of the current 1 picoampere. As we increase the current, this difference in impedance reduces drastically. For example, at 1 microampere current, both diode impedances are around 25 kilo ohm. Now this R1 clearly makes a difference. And at this value of current, it is in fact negative feedback gain which dominates the loop. So we see that at extremely low value of currents, loop has positive feedback. And for the higher value of current, it has negative feedback. Now positive feedback is a regenerative feedback. This kind of feedback is often used in digital latches or the comparators. Effect of regenerative feedback is to cause a runaway action. So any difference in the input will be continuously amplified until the circuit saturates. In relation to this circuit, what it means is that any tiny difference in the current at the origin will be amplified. So we see that both the currents start at zero, but then they start to diverge, that means become different. On the other hand, negative feedback is known as degenerative feedback. Its action is to attenuate any disturbances around desired operating point. So for example, if any disturbance causes the desired operating point to move right, the negative feedback will bring it back to the original point. So we see that in that sense, these two solutions to this circuit are not symmetrical. The solution at origin has positive feedback in its vicinity, while the other solution has negative feedback. So in that sense, the other solution is more stable. To get a better intuitive feel, we can compare this situation to the ball in the hill and the valley. Imagine an uneven surface containing one hill and one valley. Similar to our band gap circuit, there are two stable points in this surface. Stable point in the surface means points where ball can stay still. The first stable point is at the top of the hill and the other stable point is at the bottom of the valley. Now here also these two operating points are not symmetrical. If we disturb the ball at the bottom of the valley, then it will come back to its stable point. In that sense, it is a degenerative stable point. On the other hand, if we give a slight push to the ball at the top of the hill, it cannot come back. So top of the hill is akin to the stable point at the origin and the bottom of the valley is equivalent to the desired operating point. Now, if you give a little thought, you may say that in that case, we don't need the setup circuit at all because there will always be some tiny difference in these two current because of noise or because of mismatch. 
and that will cause the regenerative action at undesired operating point and move it to the desired operating point. Now this is true in some sense but there are two issues with this approach. The first problem is although the regenerative feedback will move the operating point from undesired location to desired location, the time taken in this process is not well defined. So left on its own it may come up very quickly or it may take a very long time to start. In practical circuit designs you would like to have a better handle on this startup time. The second problem is more serious problem and it is caused by the offset of this amplifier. To understand that let's consider again how this startup process works. In this curve there will be a switchover point where positive feedback turns into negative feedback. So let's assume that that switchover occurs at this line. So loop feedback is positive on the left and negative on the right. Now job of positive feedback is to move the operating point from a point where the difference between V1 and V3 is 0 to a point where there is a finite difference between V1 and V3. And this difference must have a particular polarity that is V1 must be higher than V3. And after that negative feedback takes over and moves the point to the desired operating point. Now any amplifier has a finite offset and that offset being random can have any polarity. Now if amplifier happens to have a large offset in such a way that V3 is higher than V1 near the origin, then this loop will tend to sustain this operating point. Since amplifier has high gain, a high enough value of V3 will make the output of amplifier so high that P1 and P2 will be effectively off. In that sense it is similar to the situation that there is a small local value on the top itself. And it will take big enough push that is big enough startup current to get things started. In real circuit there is a third reason which makes startup circuit a necessity. In many chips band gap is the first circuit to start in the chip. So this whole circuit needs to be self biased that means amplifier bias comes from band gap circuit itself. In absence of any current this circuit is likely to stay at the origin that is zero current and zero voltages. So now that we have made a good case for the startup circuit, let's see some of the ways a startup can be implemented in the band gap circuits. The sole purpose of startup circuit is to inject high NF current into these two branches. We are particularly interested in injecting current into this branch. Now this injection can be done either in one shot way or in a continuous manner. In one shot startup we inject the current only once when we turn on the circuit. For example in a very crude one shot startup circuit we can have capacitive coupling between enable signal and V1 node. Although one shot startup circuits are simple and they may not require a static current consumption. In my view they are not very reliable. This is because this type of startup doesn't continuously monitor the band gap. So if band gap fails to start or worse if comes back to the undesired point we are in trouble. And for that reason always on startup circuits are preferred scheme for most of the band gap circuits. Always on startup schemes also inject current at appropriate point in the band gap circuit. Let's briefly consider two such points. One obvious point is to inject current into V1. Now this current itself can be generated by a very simple diode resistor circuit which is guaranteed to start. A second point can be the output of amplifier. We want to pull the VG down so that P1 and P2 turn on and inject current in these two branches. Now these startup currents need not to be very precise but there are some important design considerations. If startup current is too low then amplifier may not start at all. On the other hand a very high startup current causes a overshoot and ringing in the output. So in this video we have seen the necessity and mechanism of startup in band gap circuits. In the next video we will expand this amplifier into the real circuit and will consider the implementation of startup circuit in some more details. I hope you found this discussion useful. So post your comment below and thanks for watching.